Today I want to share with you an easy roast goose recipe with a port wine cherry sauce. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things, consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget to click on the little notification bell below. That'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Now the first thing that I want to say is if at any time you want to jump ahead, be sure to open the description underneath this video where I'll have timestamps listing everything that I'm going to cover. And also while you're in the description underneath this video, I also have a link that'll take you over to the recipe that you can read online or print out. Now, if you've never roasted a goose before, don't worry. This is relatively easy to do, and it makes a wonderful presentation for any type of celebratory meal, but especially nice for a Christmas dinner. And today we're going to be like Mrs. Cratchit and create a Charles Dickens Christmas Carol dinner by roasting this stuffed with a sage and onion stuffing. Now the first ingredient that you're going to need is your goose. And the goose that I have here is about nine and a half pounds. And geese at the grocery store may come somewhere between eight pounds to as maybe as large as 16 pounds. But generally the average size is somewhere between eight and 12 pounds. Now this goose that's nine and a half pounds can probably serve about six people. Now as to price, a goose is going to be less expensive than something like a big beef standing rib roast. But of your more specialty poultries, goose is going to be a little more expensive than duck or rock cornish hens. And in a previous video, I showed you how to roast rock cornish hens, and I also showed you how to roast a duck, both of which also make wonderful dinners for various celebrations or especially Christmas dinner. And I'll be sure to link to those videos in the description below as well as the iCards. Now if you've purchased your goose frozen, you'll want to give it at least a day or two to defrost in your refrigerator before you get ready to cook it. And once you've let your goose defrost, then you can remove the wrapper. And once you remove the wrapper, you're going to want to remove the giblets from the cavity of your goose. And you're most likely going to have a neck, a heart, a gizzard, and a liver. Now I'm going to set the neck aside because I'm going to use that when I make bone broth with the carcass of the goose. And for the heart and the gizzard, I'm going to chop that up, quickly saute it, and use that in our stuffing. And for the liver, I'm going to saute that up with a little butter and then just turn that into a little bit of goose liver pate that we can enjoy on some toast points. Goose liver is really a delicacy and not something that's always easy to find and it can also be rather on the pricey side. So we'll just sort of have a little mini goose liver pate with that. Now there is a little bit of preparation that goes into preparing our goose before we're ready to stuff it and roast it. And what I recommend is cutting off these very bony wing tips here. What I like to do is use my heavy duty kitchen shears and just cut off these wing tips and then I'll set them aside with the goose neck and I'll use that along with the carcass when I make the bone broth. So I basically just find where the joint is and break it off there and then just go in with my scissors and finish off cutting off my wing tip. So after you remove the wing tips, next you're going to want to look at the area on the bottom side of the cavity. Now on the bottom side of this cavity, you're going to see flaps of skin. And when you pull those flaps of skin back, it's going to reveal a lot of fat. You've got a lot of goose fat in here. Now, if we were not stuffing this goose, you could cut away a lot of this flap area as well as all of the fat. But since we are going to stuff this goose, I'm going to save the flaps so that I can cover up some of the stuffing. And by covering it up, I really help keep it in the goose. 
However, we don't need all of this extra fat. So what I'm going to do is cut this out and I'm going to put it in the bottom of my roasting pan and let it render with all of the other fat that we're going to let render out of this goose. Now next, if you want, you can leave on the tail and it can just serve as a little bit of a support for all of the stuffing that we're going to put into this goose. Or if you prefer, just from a presentation standpoint, to remove it, you can do that as well. I'm going to go ahead and remove it. Now this is also going to go into my bowl with my scraps because I'm going to use this when I make the bone broth because the tail is very rich in collagen which once cooked becomes gelatin and that's what makes your bone broth very gelatinous. And the more gelatinous your bone broth the better because gelatin is very healing to our digestive tract. Next, you want to look at the top end of the cavity. And here you're going to see that you have a lot of skin. Now, since I will be stuffing the cavity, both the lower end and the upper end, I will still remove some of the skin because this is much more than we will need. But I am going to reserve a little bit just to cover that stuffing that I'll have here in the upper cavity part. But how much you want to keep or remove is totally up to you. If you want, you can cut away most of the skin here at the neck portion of the cavity, and then you can even go in there and remove the wishbone. But since I'm gonna be stuffing it, I'm not gonna worry about that. So I'm just gonna go ahead and remove some of this skin, just leaving a little bit of it down on the bottom. Now, with this extra skin that you trim off your goose, you have a couple of options. You, you can go ahead and just throw this into your scrap bowl and use this uh, when you make your bone broth, or you can go ahead and throw it into the bottom of your roasting pan and let some of this fat render off during the roasting process. We're gonna have plenty of fat rendering from this goose, so I'm gonna go ahead and use this piece for my, my bone broth. Now I do want to mention for those of you who are uncomfortable working with raw poultry, if you want to wear disposable gloves to do this whole process, you certainly can. Now I'm going to go give my hands a good wash and then we're going to move on to the next step. Now the next thing that you want to do is pierce the skin of your goose all over because this piercing is going to allow the fat to render out from your goose. Now, some people like to use a knife and make hatch hash marks. I don't like to do that, as I shared with you when I made the duck, uh, which that's also a common pro process to uh, make the hash marks. I find that it doesn't make for a, a very attractive presentation after the goose is cooked. So instead, what I like to do is take the tines of a very sharp fork, this is for a carving fork, or uh, a trussing needle can work very well, or a, a skewer that you may use for shish kebab. Any of those will work well. And then what you need to do is do this sort of on a 45 degree angle. You don't want to go in like this because we don't want to pierce the meat. Piercing the meat can cause it to dry out. And I know that seems funny because there's so much fat in a goose, but the fat really renders out. And if we pierce the meat, it can dry out. So take your fork, your skewer, whatever you're using, and just start going all over your goose just with maybe about an inch apart uh, each uh, insertion. And we're gonna go all over until we've poked this goose completely, both the top and the bottom, the wings, the legs, everything. Now that we've got our goose all prepped, we're gonna make the stuffing. Now in the book, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens, Mrs. Cratchit stuffs her goose with a sage and onion stuffing. And a sage and onion stuffing actually has a very long history in England. It was very popular with Queen Elizabeth I, which I believe she lived in the 1500s. And A Christmas Carol is set in Victorian England in the 1800s. Now what I've got here is about 9 or 10 cups of stale bread cubes. 
You can use any stale bread that you have. That'll be completely fine. Next, you're gonna need some sage seasoning. And what I have here is basically dried sage. If you don't have dried sage and you have it maybe mixed in with a poultry seasoning, you can certainly use that as well. Something like Bell's poultry seasoning would work fine. I also had some dehydrated herbs, primarily sage, with a little bit of parsley, I think, a little bit of onion. I'm gonna go ahead and add that as well. I thought it would really help with a flavor boost. And in addition to your breadcrumbs and your sage seasoning, you're also gonna want four onions. And I have four yellow onions here and they're pretty good size onions. Now we're just gonna chop up these onions, a pretty small chop, like a dice almost. We don't want too large a piece of onion in our stuffing. Now, don't throw out your scraps. Your onion skins are loaded with nutrition, very similar to the actual onion itself. So be sure to put this in your bowl along with your scraps that you're gonna to use to make your goose bone broth. Now that we've got our onions all chopped up, we're gonna go ahead and add this in with our stale bread cubes. Then I'm just gonna mix this up real well to make sure I have the onions well distributed amongst the breadcrumbs or bread cubes. Then we're gonna go ahead and add in all of our sage seasoning. And I'm gonna do the same thing, just mixing everything up to get it well distributed amongst the onions and the bread cubes. Now in my little saucepan here, I have 12 tablespoons of melted butter. And to that, I chopped up the gizzard and I chopped up the heart from the goose and I put it into the melted butter just to start cooking it a little bit. And now we're just gonna go ahead and pour all of this right on top of our bread cube mixture. Then I'm just gonna do the same thing and distribute this butter and the giblets throughout our bread cube mixture. Boy, the sage smells wonderful. It's going to also smell wonderful once it's in the goose and roasting in the oven. Now we're gonna need about three cups of liquid that we're gonna go ahead and add to our bread cube mixture. And we'll just add a little bit at a time. And what I've got here actually is chicken bone broth. You can use just a simple chicken broth if you've got that. You can use turkey broth or turkey bone broth if you have any leftover or that you made with your leftover uh, turkey carcass from Thanksgiving. Uh, if you don't have either of those, don't worry. You can certainly just use water. Now I'm gonna go ahead and add in more of our liquid. I think this is gonna wind up taking all three cups, so I'm gonna go ahead and just add it all in at once. And now I'm gonna just mix this again. Now we'll just set aside our stuffing for a minute and give it a chance to absorb all that liquid we added. And now we're going to season the outside of our goose. Now what I've got here in my bowl is a little mixture of salt and pepper and other seasonings. I do have a full tablespoon of sea salt. It's a fine ground sea salt. You can use any fine ground salt you have. And you may be saying, wow, that's a lot of salt. The skin of the goose needs a lot of salt. You're going to be using more salt than you think you would need because that's going to play a role in helping pull out some of the moisture and make sure that the skin of your goose cooks up nice and crisp. Other ways to really ensure that your goose comes out with a nice crisp skin is to do a wet brine or a dry brine, or you can simply defrost your goose and then put it on a platter and then put it into your refrigerator uncovered and let the skin dry out overnight. That is often recommended by chefs. And if you've ever seen a cooking show with Jacques Pepin, the famous French chef and cookbook author, that's how he prepares his goose. He lets it defrost and then he leaves it uncovered overnight in his refrigerator. But this way is also going to ensure that we're gonna get a nice crisp skin and it's great if you didn't remember to brine it or leave it overnight in your refrigerator uncovered. 
So what I've got here, as I said, is the tablespoon of fine ground sea salt. I also have a teaspoon of Chinese five, five spice powder, work, which works very well on goose, especially if you're making this during the Christmas season, because it has some wonderful spices in it. It has cloves and cinnamon and fennel and star anise and so it's very delightful. It also has some Szechuan pepper in it but I'm also going to add about a quarter of a teaspoon of freshly ground black pepper just to add a little more spice. And then finally what I've got over here is a teaspoon of paprika. It's just the regular paprika. You could certainly use the smoked paprika if you like that but this is just the regular plain paprika and it helps with a wonderful coloring of the skin as you're roasting it to make it look very appetizing when you bring it to the table. So I'm just going to go ahead and just mix this up very gently with give it a good stir actually not too gently <laughs> and then we're going to go ahead and start rubbing this right into the skin of our goose. So here we go we're just going to just do like this nothing fancy. Oh, this smells so good. It just smells like Christmas time. And you want to rub your goose all over, including the underside. Now, I'm not going to rub the cavity with any of this seasoning mix because we do have our stuffing that's very well seasoned. However, I'm not going to wash my hands between rubbing the the rub, the spice rub, into the ex uh, exterior of the goose uh, as I go to go ahead and stuff it. And some of the flavoring from the exterior will transfer to the stuffing, just kind of pulling all of the flavors together, yet not be overwhelming. I don't want anything to overwhelm the sage flavoring. Now, once this absorbs all the liquid, you'll be able to actually form this into, you know, little shapes of uh, little ball shapes uh, very easily and that makes it very easy to go ahead and stuff it into the cavity of your bird and I'm just going to start first here with the upper side the side where the neck was and the only reason that I form this into little ball shapes is it's just a little easier for me to get it into the smaller side of the cavity and then once I'm happy with how much I have in there then I'm just going to kind of tuck this skin in to hold in my stuffing. Now I've just got the flaps pulled back on the bottom side of the cavity and I'm going to go ahead and just start stuffing that with our mixture. Now once you get your goose all stuffed then you can take these flaps and just cover up your stuffing. That'll help keep it inside. Now should you trust the closing that you've covered, use the goose skin to cover your stuffing with? I don't recommend it. I also don't recommend tying the legs. And the reason is, unlike a turkey or a chicken, the goose has so much fat, the easier you make it for the fat to render, the easier it is to cook the goose or roast the goose and then you don't have to worry about overcooking the breast meat, which we'll talk about in a minute. Because basically you're using these flaps to just sort of hold your stuffing in while it's uncooked. As your goose roasts, this skin is going to roast as well, uh, clearly, and it'll start to pull back a little. Some of the stuffing will become exposed, but it'll all pretty much stay in place because it started out covered. Alrighty, well now how do we go about roasting this goose? First, what I like to do is preheat my oven to 425 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we're not going to roast this goose at that high temperature, but I like to put my goose into a nice hot oven to get the rendering process started. 
And because once we open the oven and get the roasting pan and put our goose in there, the temperature lowers. And so this way, at least we're getting off to a relatively good start. But once we close that oven door, we're going to lower the temperature to 325 degrees Fahrenheit. Since there is a lot of fat in this goose, do we start roasting it similar to the way we roast a duck? Are we going to put this breast side down and then halfway through flip it back up to breast side up? That is certainly an option. And if it's not stuffed, I think that's a very easy thing to do. But since I stuffed this goose, I'm going to keep it or I'm going to cook it more in the same fashion I would cook a stuffed turkey. So I am going to start this breast up and I'm going to let it roast the entire time breast up. And since I like to cook this goose to an internal temperature of around 170 degrees Fahrenheit, it's going to be in that 325 degree Fahrenheit oven for a good while. Stuffed like this and being nine and a half pounds is probably going to take about three and a half hours to reach that satisfactory internal temperature of 170 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's going to give the fat in this goose plenty of time to render and plenty of time for the skin to brown beautifully. But by all means, if you like starting with it breast side down, you can certainly do that. Now let's talk about the internal temperature of what I like to do when roasting this goose. Now you may see chefs recommending that you can cook your goose to the point where the breast registers at 135 degrees Fahrenheit up to 145 degrees Fahrenheit. And that would be cooking the goose breast to a rare or medium rare consistency. I really don't like that. Also, at that point when the breast reaches that internal temperature in that range from 135 to 145, they'll recommend removing the goose from the oven, cutting out the breast, setting that aside to keep warm, and then putting the goose back into the oven to continue roasting till the thigh and the legs are at the proper temperature. And generally at that point in terms of the breast being 135 degrees to 145 degrees, the fat or at least the skin has not had a chance to crisp up very nicely. So at that point they'll recommend often sauteing skin, the breast skin side down in a saute pan and then bringing that to your platter along with the legs and the thigh so you're serving your goose already carved. I find that to be a lot of work and I'm also, as I mentioned earlier, not a fan of when the goose breast is rare or medium rare. Here in the United States, the U.S. Department of Agriculture recommends roasting a goose to an internal temperature of 165 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's using a meat thermometer that is inserted into the thigh of the goose away from the bone. I even find that a little rare for my tastes. So I am more comfortable roasting my goose, as I mentioned earlier, to 170 degree Fahrenheit internal temperature. And I have even been known to roast a goose to an internal temperature of 180 degrees Fahrenheit. But I wanted to give you all of these ranges of temperature, internal temperature, because everyone has different tastes as to what they like. And in our family, we like pretty much all our poultry well cooked. And at an internal temperature of 170 degrees Fahrenheit, I do not find that the breast meat is dry. And the cherry sauce that we're going to make to serve with it would definitely rectify any bit of dryness if there is any. But the bottom line is I feel that this is a very easy way to roast a goose and to roast it where it's going to be palatable to most people, especially if you're serving this at a celebratory meal or a holiday meal like Christmas, and maybe people have never had goose before. 
and may not be accustomed to eating game birds and not accustomed to eating game birds rare or medium rare. Having your goose well cooked and having a nice sauce to serve on the side, in my humble opinion, makes this very palatable to pretty much everybody, or at least everybody who eats poultry. Now I'm gonna gingerly pick up our goose and put it right down into our roasting pan. So into our oven it goes. I'm gonna lower the heat to 325 degrees Fahrenheit. And then every 30 minutes, we're going to check on our goose and we're going to remove the rendered fat. And the way I recommend doing that is to re take your roasting pan out of the oven, put it on a heat proof surface and use some sort of baster or a large spoon to remove the fat and then transfer it to a container for storage. But we do want to remove that fat as it renders because we don't want it to burn. Now there are two things that I want to mention before we go ahead and put this into the oven is number one, if you have a small oven, I have a very small oven, so I'm going to put my roasting pan with the goose in it into or onto the lowest rack of my oven. I'm going to put it into the lower third. If you have a very large oven, it's not a problem, but I don't want the top to brown too quickly. And if by any chance you do find that no matter where you put your goose in the oven, depending what rack you put it on, that it does start to brown too quickly, you can always tent it with aluminum foil while it continues to roast until it's done. And then just remove the aluminum foil like the last five minutes or so. And the other thing that I want to mention about roasting a goose is that you do need to use a roasting pan and a rack. You want the goose lifted up off of the bottom of your roasting pan so that the fat can render and so that the goose is not sitting in the fat. And you do need a roasting pan as, a, as opposed to just a baking sheet because of the size of a goose as opposed to a duck, which you can generally roast on a baking sheet with a rack, but with a goose because it tends to be larger and is going to release more fat, then what can happen is if you just have a baking sheet with a rack that it can uh, the, the fat can overwhelm, in essence, and flow over the rim of the baking sheet. And you don't want to have to keep opening the oven more than every 30 minutes. So that is why I highly recommend using a roasting pan. Alrighty, now into the oven. Well, while the goose is roasting, I want to show you the amount of fat that I removed from the roasting pan just after 30 minutes. And the way that I like to remove the fat from the roasting pan is by bringing my roasting pan out of my oven, putting it on a heat proof surface, and then using a baster, you may know it as like a turkey baster, to simply siphon out the fat and then put it into my glass storage container. I may wind up needing more than one of these, but what I like to do is put a little strainer over my jar that I'm using to uh, store my goose fat because that helps collect some of the little bits and bobs that I may uh, suction up with my turkey baster. Now that does take a minute or two to do. You could certainly do it a faster way by lifting the rack with the goose on it out of your roasting pan and then simply pouring uh, the fat out of the roasting pan. The only thing is I find that not necessarily complicated, but I need to make sure I have plenty of heat proof areas to put the rack on and put the roasting pan on and to be extremely careful so that I'm never burning myself because the roasting pan is a little on the heavy side and to lift it for an extended period while I'm pouring the fat always seems a little precarious to me. But certainly if you're a little more maybe coordinated than me, definitely you can do it that way. But I find this turkey baster works like a charm. Now once I get all of my goose fat into my containers, one I will store in the refrigerator 
because I'll be using that on a regular basis and the other I'll put in the freezer and then just take that out when I use this one up. And I have to say that if you've never had goose fat, and I would completely understand if you hadn't because it is getting harder to find goose fat. Duck fat is a little more common, but goose fat is difficult to find. But if you are blessed to roast a goose and then have your own rendered goose fat, you've got to fry up some potatoes in it. You have never had fried potatoes until they've been fried in goose fat. They're absolutely delicious. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Mrs. Cratchit in the Charles Dickens Christmas Carol book uh, serves her goose with the uh, sage and onion stuffing. And as the side, she serves mashed potatoes and applesauce. But what I'm going to do is serve some roasted potatoes that have been roasted in, you guessed it, goose fat. And if you want, you can do sort of like a cheat roasting uh, process where you simply put some goose fat in a large saute pan or a large frying pan and cut your potatoes in half, put them cut side down and let them cook like that and they'll become beautifully browned on the bottom and cooked through uh, in the middle. And I'll have directions for everything that I show you today in the printed recipe, not just the goose instructions, but the stuffing as well as the potatoes. Alternatively, you could cut your potatoes in half and then you could put them in the bottom of your roasting pan underneath the rack that you have your goose sitting on and let them roast together in about the last hour of roasting time. And what I like to do, whether I'm roasting them in the pan or sort of cheat roasting them on top of the stovetop, I like to use red skinned potatoes, basically for two reasons. Number one, they roast up very well, whether you put them in the roasting pan with your goose or you do a cheat roast on the stovetop. And secondly, because of the red skin, they look lovely when they're presented on a platter with the goose for a lovely holiday celebration like Christmas. I get a fairly good size red potato. I don't buy the tiny little ones, although you certainly could, and you would just wanna put them in closer to the finished time of your goose if you're gonna roast them in the oven with your goose. You may wanna put them in maybe about 30 minutes uh, before you're ready to take your goose out of the oven. But I really find this size, sort of like a, you know, maybe like a bay would be about the size of a baseball maybe, uh, works very well. And I just cut it right in half and put it uh, cut side down into the roasting pan or into my frying pan. Now, this works best if you have somewhat of an angled roasting pan like I do, uh, or not a roasting pan, an angled roasting rack like I do because this gives you plenty of room to put your potatoes underneath. If you have a roasting rack that fits closer to the bottom of your roasting pan, this may be a little more challenging to do. So that's why I always like to share with you that this is also very easy to do on the stovetop. Now I do wanna mention something that's very important to be aware of when it comes to cooking a goose and the whole process of rendering the fat. You may see recipes that tell you to poke the goose all over the way we did and then submerge it into boiling water for maybe 10 minutes. This process helps to extract some of the goose fat and then in turn helps cut down on the roasting time. And not only does it cut down on the roasting time, it also reduces the amount of goose fat that will render down into your roasting pan. To a certain extent, this process could be very helpful if you have an exceptionally shallow roasting pan. However, it's not a process that I like to do. Number one, I find working with something that's almost 10 pounds, a 10 pound, mine was not in a half pound goose, trying to submerge it into boiling water and then take it back out again. I just find the process a little, not just time consuming, but a little laborious and a little awkward. Also, I'm losing that wondrous goose fat. Now, can you cool all of that water down to, from the pot from which you submerged 
your goose definitely. Uh, but that's going to take some time to allow that much water to cool. And then are, are you going to just scoop off the fat the best you can? Maybe use the fat separator that I've shared with you that I like to use when I make bone broth. Uh, there are some different ways to kind of rescue that goose fat so that you don't lose it. However, again, these are all time consuming and as I said, somewhat what I consider somewhat laborious methods. Uh, so I find just put the goose into the roasting pan raw, roast it, and then just check every 30 minutes to start removing your goose fat. Now, while the goose is roasting, we'll get ready to make some of the port wine cherry sauce that is absolutely scrumptious. Now, don't worry if you don't have port wine or if you don't want to use any alcohol in making this cherry sauce, no problem. You can substitute grape juice and you'll just want to use half the amount of grape juice and then half water. We're going to use one cup of the port. So you would use half a cup of grape juice and half a cup of water. Now you're not limited by grape juice. If you wanted to use some apple juice or even maybe some cherry juice, which would be very nice given that we're making a cherry sauce, you could certainly do that. But again, you're just going to use half the amount of juice and then dilute it with half water. And if you're not familiar with port, what port is, is it's called a fortified wine. And fortified wines of any kind are basically wines that have had something added to them. Different types of grapes, maybe sometimes different types of liquors, whatever the case may be. But the whole point of adding something to the wine is to slow down and eventually stop the fermentation process. And when we stop the fermentation process, we create something that is a bit sweeter with the natural sugars from the grapes than a traditional wine that has been fermented longer. So fortified wines are very nice to have on hand to cook with because they often have a lovely flavor. And because they've been fortified and the fermentation process has been stopped, they're often sold with screw tops as opposed to a cork. And so this really makes them a home cook's best friend because if you have wine and you uncork it and it's not all consumed, say at a dinner party or something at one sitting and you put it back into your pantry and then maybe weeks later you say, oh, I think I'm going to use some of that maybe as the acid base for your bone broth or whatever the case may be. And then you open it and you smell it and it smells almost like vinegar because it kept fermenting and it had been exposed to air which as we learned from when we make homemade vinegar, the air contains something known as acetobacter, which helps the process of wine to turn into vinegar. I also like keeping fortified wines like this on hand because my husband and I don't drink, but when I make a bone broth or a sauce like this, I really like to use a fortified wine. For bone broth, you need some sort of acidic medium to help extract the nutrients out of the bones that then is what makes your bone broth very nutritious. Now, can you use some vinegar? Certainly. Can you use some citrus juice? Certainly. But I have found from experience and from taste that using some sort of fortified wine, like a white vermouth if I'm used making a chicken bone broth, or a red vermouth, or a port, or a marsala, or Madeira, whatever the case may be when I'm making a um, beef bone broth, that the flavor is much softer. And for the most part, because this is such a long cooking time involved when making bone broth, you're more or less cooking off a lot of the alcohol. But if you have any concerns about that at all, or if you absolutely cannot have any alcohol in your diet, you can, as I mentioned, use vinegar or uh, some citrus-based juice, or even often just taking an orange or a lemon or a lime, whatever the case may be, and squeezing that right into your bone broth. That will work well also. And again, for making a sauce like this, juice makes a wonderful substitution for the port. Now I tried to keep our goose relatively authentic 
by making a simple roast goose with the sage and onion stuffing like Mrs. Cratchit did in A Christmas Carol. But I am, what did they say, zhuzhing it up a little <laughs> with uh, the cherry sauce because this is Christmas, this is holiday time, and I think it just really makes for a lovely flavor uh, that is so complimentary. But I wanted to read a passage to you from the book A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens uh, to share with you the lovely, just absolutely delightful enthusiasm and gratitude that the Cratchit family had for the lovely dinner, lovely Christmas dinner that Mrs. Cratchit was making for her family. And I think that you'll enjoy this. If you're already familiar with the book, you, you probably know what I'm going to read. But if not, uh, I first of all, I just want to say I love this book. I love the story, A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. It's, to me, in my humble opinion, one of the most beautiful stories of redemption uh, that I have ever read in terms of a fictional story. It's just very, very heartwarming, and I think that it is enjoyable for pretty much everyone in the family. Uh, and if you like movies, you've got to see the movie Scrooge, where Albert Finney plays Scrooge. It's a musical. It was made in, the, I believe, the 1970s. We love it. We watch it every year, and it never gets old. It's just a wonderful, wonderful movie. But let me go ahead and read to you this passage. Actually, let me get my bifocals <laughs> so that I can really do this reading justice. Such a bustle ensued that you may have thought a goose, the rarest of all birds, a feathered phenomenon, to which a black swan was a matter of course. And in truth, it was something very like it in that house. Mrs. Cratchit made the gravy, ready beforehand in a little saucepan, hissing hot. Master Peter mashed the potatoes with incredible vigor. Miss Belinda sweetened up the applesauce. Martha dusted the hot plates. Bob took Tiny Tim beside him in a tiny corner at the table. The two young Cratchits set chairs for everybody, not forgetting themselves, and mounting guard upon their posts, crammed spoons into their mouths, lest they should shriek for goose before their turn came to be helped. At last the dishes were set on, and grace was said. It was succeeded by a breathless pause, as Mrs. Cratchit, looking slowly along the carving knife, prepared to plunge it into the breast. But when she did, and when the long-expected gush of stuffing issued forth, one murmur of delight arose all around the board, and even Tiny Tim, excited by the two young Cratchits, beat on the table with the handle of his knife and feebly cried, hurrah, and it continues. There never was such a goose. Bob said he didn't believe there even was such a goose cooked. Its tenderness and flavor, size and cheapness were the themes of universal admiration. So if you like A Christmas Carol and you tend to like frequenting used bookstores, you may come across this. This is an older book, but it has wonderful illustrations throughout. They're beautifully uh, colorful and the pages are a little on the shiny side. They're very, very nice. This is just a delightful book to have. And then this little gem I wanted to share with you, I found at a library sale and it's the Charles Dickens cookbook. And it basically has recipes from different foods that span the gamut of all the books that he wrote. And then this is something fun. This is called a book to table classic. And basically it contains the complete novel uh, of A Christmas Carol by Charles Dickens. And then it has recipes for your holiday menu from various uh, famous chefs and home cooks. Martha Stewart has something in here. Uh, Trisha Yearwood, the country western singer, has something in here. And just different people like that. And it's more, they're more sharing, I think, the holiday recipes that they like. But you also have the reading of the book as well.
Well, I've been continuing to remove the rendered goose fat as the goose is cooking. And I just want to show you this glorious amount of fat that I've obtained so far. So I've moved on. I think I'll get enough to finish this smaller, or <laughs> fill this smaller jar once we're finished. But now I wanted to show you how to make this cherry sauce. And it's very easy. All you need is just get a small saucepan. And in here, I've got about two tablespoons of butter. Uh, this is not an exact science, so you don't have, you can kind of eyeball things if you want. But so I've got about two tablespoons of butter in there. I'm going to go ahead and pour in my one cup of port. And then what I've got here is a jar of Morello cherry fruit spread. It's got more fruit than sugar, so that's a good thing. But uh, there are also different types of cherry jams and cherry preserves out there. There's even one that's a sour cherry, if you like a little bit of a tang uh, to your sauce. But this morel cherry, I think it's going to be quite lovely. And this is, un this is sort of unusual. This is a 17 ounce size jar. So if you have a 16 ounce jar, or if you have a 12 ounce jar, it's going to be fine. And all you're gonna do is go ahead and just empty out your jar right into your saucepan. Now that I've got everything in my saucepan, I'm gonna go and put this over on my stovetop on low heat, and I'm gonna whisk it to get the butter melted and the port wine mixed in nicely with the cherry jam. And then I'm going to let it simmer on low until it reduces by about half. It may take you know, maybe about 30 minutes or so. But the secret is to make sure that you have it on a very low setting, the lowest setting. Uh, after you bring it up to a simmer, then just turn it down and get everything nicely mixed. Turn it down to the lowest setting on your cooktop. I even have a setting called melt, which is very low. And that works wonderfully for something like this. Well, I just took this glorious goose out of the oven and it looks wonderful. It's cooked to 170 degrees Fahrenheit, internal temperature. And so now I'm gonna get ready to plate it. I'll show you how I like to plate it up to serve it and we'll take a taste. Well, I've put this goose on my Christmas platter and I've surrounded it with those roasted potatoes and then I just sprinkled with the red skin roasted potatoes and then I sprinkled them with a little bit of chopped fresh flat leaf Italian parsley so we could kind of get the red and green Christmas theme going on. But this looks lovely. The Goose is cooked to perfection. Look at how this glorious stuffing is flowing out of the cavity. I think it's just going to be scrumptious. And I want you to hear, I'm gonna go with the mic a little close. I want you to hear this skin. Can you hear that? It's nice and crisp. I just have to turn this around and show you how pretty this is. I love how the sage and onion stuffing is just flowing out so bountiful. It just looks very Abu Danza, and you know I like that. And these roasted potatoes with a little bit of the parsley sprinkled on top really look lovely. Alrighty, well what I'm gonna do is slice into the breast so you can see exactly what the breast meat looks like cooked to 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Now I also want to mention, don't worry if you don't have a meat thermometer. If your goose is somewhere, you know, around nine to 10 pounds like mine, and you cook it stuffed for three and a half hours, chances are it will be done. You can give the leg a little jiggle and it'll feel loose and then you make a little tiny incision. And if the juices run clear, you know you're set. Now I'm gonna overlay some pictures of this breast so that you can see it up close. And I think you'll be able to see that it's quite juicy. This is not the least bit dry at all. And if you've never had goose before, the breast meat in many ways is very similar to the dark meat on a turkey. It does have that darker and sometimes a bit of pink coloration to it. Now I've got this lovely cherry port wine sauce and I'm just going to go ahead and drizzle a little bit of this on the P 
piece, the taste test that I'm going to take. Now, when it comes to this sauce, you can strain out the little bits of cherry if you want. I kind of like leaving them in. I think that it just gives the sauce a little bit of a nice texture, but that's totally up to you. Well, let's give this a taste. Mmm. Mmm. That's so tender, so juicy, so flavorful, and that cherry sauce really adds a wonderful taste. Now, if you'd like more recipes for your holiday or celebratory table that includes how to make rock Cornish game hens and how to roast a duck, be sure to click on this video over here where I have a wonderful playlist full of great holiday meals. And I look forward to seeing you there over in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless, and I want to wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.